right, thanks everyone. Um, opening the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors at 6.32 p.m. Uh, glad to see so many people in the room. As you probably got from our notice, we have some very important budget topics to talk about tonight. I just want to kind of preface it that tonight is really about information. As you know, there was a, a change in the law, Act 127, uh, that is designed to change how uh, students are weighted, which is a very important part of our funding formula in terms of how much we get from the state versus how much the town is asked to pay. Uh, there is, as Libby's going to explain, there's some phase in provisions that have uh, pretty serious implications, but the overall uh, the overall message is that we're in a situation where uh, we are likely to face several years of cuts or exorbitant, and I mean exorbitant, tax increases. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Tonight is not about figuring out how to deal with that. Tonight is about assessing the situation, asking some questions for the administration to come up with some various scenarios so we can chart the best path forward. Uh, I want to make very clear that um, you know this law is very well intentioned. Uh, it is meant to get more money to uh, students with higher needs. Uh, that said, as, as you're going to see, it, it has very real implications for our town uh, and for our ability to uh, provide the educational services that we want to provide at the level of affordability we've been able to in the past. Um, and, you know, they're very real. I also want to stress that this is something we have very limited control over. Uh, and I mean very limited control over. It's something that unfortunately we are in a more of a reactive mode than a solution mode. So we're going to have to work with what the legislature gave us unless the legislature changes its mind and we are not going to count on that at all. Um, so um, we're going to have for, uh, public comment up front. We're also going to have public comment after the presentation. Um, if a lot of people are wanting to give public comment, um, I'm going to limit the time and I'm going to do so in a way that, you know, make sure everybody has a chance to say something succinct, but not to go on and on and on. Um, not that anyone does that, but occasionally it happens. Um, and, but I want to make sure everyone gets heard. I also just want to, you know, again, say that we ha are going to have several meetings uh, where we're going to, you know, absorb what we have tonight, come up with proposals. Uh, tonight is not the only time that you have to say what you want to say. Uh, there's going to be ample opportunity uh, both to give commentary when we have more information, when you've, you know, absorbed the information. Um, and I also want to say that um, that, what is it, school board at mpsvt.org uh, will get an email to all of us. Uh, you may want a very, it's, we read our emails, uh, we respond to them. It's a very effective way to give us information. So uh, if you want to sit with what you hear tonight, think about it, come back to us with an email. Uh, that is a great way to do it. And again, uh, you know, we're going to probably add a meeting in December, uh, just given that this is a very unusual budget season. Uh, we'll have uh, listening sessions and meetings in January. Uh, we have about two and a half months uh, to, <clears throat> you know, consider this. So it's a long process. Uh, and tonight is really just absorbing the situation we're in. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on and then kind of move to next steps, which are, you know, some scenarios and, uh, you know, eventually making decisions. So um, long process. Uh, I hope you all stick with us through it and, and give input. It, it really helps us make decisions. Uh, but this is a situation we have not been in, uh, certainly in my tenure on the board. Uh, and I really can't remember one even just as a kind of parent and caregiver in the community. So. Uh, it's a unique situation. Uh, it's not the best situation, uh, but together we will we will find a way to uh, ensure that we meet our educational goals, uh, do what we need to do for our kids, uh, and do it in a way uh, that uh, is bearable for the taxpayers. So.
with that, we're going to have initial public comment. Again, we are having another public comment session after the financial presentation. So if anyone has something they want to say before then, maybe on a non-budget related issue, uh, please either come up to the front or if you're on Zoom, uh, please use the raise hand function, which is in your reactions button. Great. Um, Seeing none. Uh, oh, you want to come up? Yeah. Okay, come on up. Uh, my name is Tom Frazier. I'm from Roxbury. Um, I've lived there for 50 years and was intimately involved in the rebuilding of the school when it started out as a two-room school and a town hall that was falling down and rat-infested. In the 1970s, we took the, a major step to rebuild the school and keep it in the middle of the, in the village so that the town would always have a town center, a town um, soul, if that's what you want to call it. Um, a lot of people wanted to close it down, move out, move it up on the ro up on the mountain road, lots of other things. We decided at that time to keep it in the village. And since then, it's been rebuilt. It's been added on to a couple of times, and it's a very nice facility. And now I feel like this board, because you have to come up with a savings of X amount of dollars, are going to throw Roxbury under the proverbial school bus to save that money. Um, when we vote on a school district, on a school budget, it's a district-wide budget. We have no separate vote for Roxbury and Montpelier. But yet, you have come up with a $33,000 per student cost versus your $24,000. Uh, $9,000 for 40 kids, that's a lot of money. But um, if we didn't have your, as I understood it, when we signed on to this merger, we became part of your $9 million debt. We had no debt. Our school was built and paid for. So now I wonder whether or not any of your debt is, is part of that $33,000 per student. There's also transportation costs that we didn't have back in the day that we now have because of this murder, merger. And those are also part of that $33,000. Um, a lot of us were against merging with Montpelier. I mean, I think it's worked out well for the students. And I, you know, I have grandchildren now in town that are going to be going through it. And I think that you know, they will benefit in the long run. But um, I'm not sure our town will benefit from losing its school. If that's because that seems to be the way you're headed. Um, the transportation costs, according to the budget that I looked at, was six hundred plus thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, that's a lot of money, and it, it all relates to transport. Not all of it, obviously, but you know, a large portion of it is having to come to Montpelier and back, however many times a day. Um, if you close the school, if you take the students out. You're still going to own the building. And you still have to maintain the building, maintain the sewer and water system that go with it, because you have local residents that are part of that system. You have a bus, busing situation that it's not, that cost is not going to go away. Um, so I question how much you really would save by closing our school when you consider the cost that it would actually be to the town itself into the town's um, you know, sense of being. So how much, how much are we really going to save? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know how you figure these things. I, I, I look at your paperwork. I don't understand any of it, and I don't pretend to. I'm just looking at it from a very practical standpoint and what the town has put into this building and into this merger, and we feel like you know, we're getting the short end of the stick which is what everybody expected would happen sometime down the road. But, you know, I feel like today is more like April 1st than, than November 1st. Something, you know, we're just, we're just, a lot of people are really upset 
and we understand, I mean, I knew this back last year, that there, that, that, that there was nothing that we could do about it. We have two votes out of nine. Um, it's not, I mean, I realize it's all based on numbers, but it really doesn't, it really doesn't do much for, for anybody's uh, peace of mind. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Um, anyone else before we go to consent agenda? Um, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? We need to include a co-curricular. And we need to include consent agenda with co-curricular included. I move to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the co-curricular. Do you have a second? Positions. A second. Uh, all, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, consent agenda passes. Jim, Ooh. can we remind people that you also offered to open up public comment after the discussion? Yeah, no, I've, I've said that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so now on to board business, which is finance committee update um, and potential approval of first quarter report. Uh, and then budget presentation. Anything from the Finance Committee on the report, particularly the first quarter report? The outstanding part from the Finance Committee um, is the costs of <clears throat> repairs from the flooding. And um, that, so that's an unusual piece of the current budget that would normally be there, but um, the Everything's being reimbursed, including FEMA will cover deductibles. So that's all seems good. Uh, yeah. And then there's some work from FEMA, FEMA to do some improvements with the electrical panel that maybe moved out of the basement in the high school here. Um, other than that, <clears throat> there's we had we had um, the the fund balance still has the track money, four hundred thousand dollars that we. Uh, agreed to make available if needed for the fiscal year 24 budget and then um, there was we're sort of projecting another 400,000 that may be available if needed for the fiscal year 25 budget um, any of that any of those things could change any of the general fund figures are remain to be actually spent <clears throat> thank you and I'm, I'm just going to add a little commentary I'm I'm guessing we are going to probably want to take all of the um, all of the reserve fund we can to help with the situation. I guess is that just because I know that's going to come up, but um, that is probably an idea that we will we will float seriously. As I think Christina said that last year there was only about seventy-eight thousand used of the four hundred thousand yeah. that had been earmarked. So yeah. that is that's been the situation. It's likely to change. Yeah. yeah, that's a, definitely something we will consider because I know that question will come up. Um, <clears throat> should we have a motion to approve the first quarter report? I move to approve the first quarter report. No second? No second. Uh, all those, any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Libby? All right. Aye. Oh, we got Jake. Oh, hey, Jake. Jake with a late, a Thanks, late Jake. eye. Jake is not feeling well. Okay, let me share my screen here. I want to start, um, before we get into any of the numbers, uh, recognizing that the information in tonight's presentation is very hard. It's hard to hear. It's hard to provide you as the superintendent and Christina, business manager, who might want to come up to the table over here. Yeah. <laughs> Christina Kimball, our business manager. Um, and I can say that Christina and I, with members of our leadership team, have, well, Christina and I in particular, and we've dragged our leadership team into it, have done little else but think of this process and these pressures for the last three weeks, um, losing a lot of sleep over these. <laughs> And so, uh, because we just were trying to get it right and understand everything. This law is complicated. 
there seems to be limited direct information as to how we apply the law. Um, so Christina and I have been down probably 500 rabbit holes um, and continue to uncover them even this afternoon when we had agency officials on the phone and I talked to probably five different superintendents and Christina talked to five different business managers just this afternoon as we uncovered another rabbit hole that we didn't quite understand in order to try to understand it all. I'd say now I'm pretty confident I'm at about 90% of understanding because there could be information that, one, quite honestly, we're wrong, um, and two, we just simply haven't understood yet because it's so complicated. So I just want to put that out to everybody um, just in recognition that, that this is hard stuff and it's complicated stuff and it's a very different way of doing things and that we have to get used to that, um, the new language and what it all means. So moving forward, the beginning slides here, how do I get rid of this one? Hold on, let's get us off the, there we go. Oh no, you get the pictures off the screen. So. There we go. Yeah, go to Thank you. Yep. And if people in the audience do not have the presentation, there's some on the back. Just a little reminder for any budget year, this one, the past five that we have done, um, there are things that the school board and administration can control, which are in green on this slide. And there are things that we have no control over whatsoever in the budget, and that's in red. So you'll notice that the red far outweighs the green. The non-tax revenue is in yellow simply because we have some control over that, and the Agency of Education has some control over that. So we have, it's not a total green or red um, piece. Uh, just, uh, oh, where's the link? So just a reminder, one of the big pressures is Act 127. That was a law enacted last year that Jim referenced in the beginning of, our pre of the board meeting tonight. It's an act that's intended to provide educational equity and quality to um, students across our, our um, state. It's a good law, and the intent behind it is a good law. Um, some of the pieces I wish they had re reconsidered. <laughs> However, the idea that our weights were outdated and did not do what it needed to do for students, is, they were right on with that, that scenario. That's gonna influence our district um, in a way that's hard. However, uh, the, the, the purpose behind this law is, as is intended is good. Um, so just keeping that in mind. There is a link to, the, to it there if anybody is interested in reading all the legislation. There's a glossary of terms. I'm not gonna go into it totally. It's just for people's reference. Um, these terms now roll off our tongues. And so if you need a, a quick definition, rabbit ear this page <laughs> um, in the presentation. So getting into uh, the weighting. Um, on the left there, there are the old weights. You can see that there were just five of them. Um, and on the right hand side are the new weights. Um, looking at, they went, the, the state and the Agency of Education went through a long study process with UVM to, to come to these weights about what was fair. Um, I will say that I honestly wish that I had been more um, understanding of it because I think they overlooked some things with these weights. So you notice there's no mental health concerns with these weights. There's no um, intervention. It's making the assumption that elementary students do not use, need intervention or remediation services. Um, it's just, there's a lot of assumptions here. It does make the assumption that a student who is multilingual needs more services, because that's accurate, right? That's an accurate um, statement. And so it did make some assumptions. It didn't make all the assumptions. Uh, now that these numbers are becoming a reality, it's a little bit we can understand that a little bit better. But these are the weights that we have currently in the new Act 127. So there are always typical pressures on our budget and 127 is adding some additional pressures. Um, so what used to be called equalized pupil is now called long-term weighted average daily membership or LTWADM. <laughs> I'm gonna use the term for this presentation as equalized pupil, simply because that's the term I'm used to and it's the term the board is used to. Um, it is pretty much the same thing. 
Uh, it's just different weights and they named it a different thing, okay? Um, our, our school district will be disadvantaged in this in equalized pupil because of Act 127. Financial decisions from school districts across the state will impact something called the dollar yield. The dollar yield is not unique to 127. Um, I don't even know if it's, if it's mentioned in 127, but the dollar yield is always part of our budgeting process. It always influences our budget one way or the other. Um, and it has to do with how flush the education fund is and how we can, Jill can make it even better than I can, but make it so we're, a dollar is worth a dollar in the eyes of the ed fund. Yeah, Jill? Sure. Okay. Um, so the new weights will result in more equalized pupils across the state. This will impact the dollar yield most likely in a negative way because we'll be drawing more from the ed fund since we will have more equalized pupils. So the dollar yield will lower. It will come closer to that dollar. Um, this number three, while it's a typical pressure in our budget, it's not gonna come into play too much in this presentation and it's not gonna really come into play if while well, I'm making some assumptions there, but the, the CLA did some wacky things here in Montpelier this year that were unique to this fiscal year and it was unexpected. This isn't gonna come into play a whole lot. Um, we thought it would, but with better understanding it's not. Let's see what the CLA is. So CLA is the common, thank you, Jim, is the common level of appraisal. It's how our houses are appraised at versus what they're selling at or what they're actually worth. Um, and so the CLA, I'll just go through this quickly, but again, it's not really gonna influence our budget tax rate this year for reasons I will explain in a bit. <laughs> um, but the CLA here in Montpelier was really low when we passed our budget last year. We passed our budget last year in Montpelier with a 74 CLA, 74% CLA. Between the time when we passed our budget and when your tax bills came out here in Montpelier, the reappraisal had happened in time for the new CLA to come into effect for the FY24 budget. All the things we're talking about is FY25. <laughs> Um, so I, we made the expectation when we passed our budget last year that the CLA for Montpelier was going to help us this year because it was going to go skyrocketing, right? But that didn't happen. That actually helped you, helped you as taxpayers this year in fiscal year 24 because it went from what we passed as a 74% CLA in um, March to 113 on your tax bills, 113%. So that skyrocket happened this year, which is great. It was a lower tax bill. Um, however, FY25, the CLA in Montpelier is expected to drop. So when it drops from year to year, that comparison, anytime it drops, that's going to increase our taxes a bit. But again, I'll explain why that doesn't have a significant influence as it would in a typical year. And, and the reason we're focused more on Montpelier with the CLA is because that is, is having a bigger impact. In Roxbury, it's not having as, it didn't and won't have as big of an impact. Yeah, the CLA doesn't move as fast in Roxbury right. as it does in Montpelier. Right. Uh, okay. So Act 127 has some pieces in it that just that has more to do with ju than just the weights that add some additional pressures and some additional reliefs, it should say. Um, and I'm sorry, if I'm talking really slowly, it's just because it's so complicated and I want to make sure that I don't just run it off. Our equalized residential tax rate, which is the tax rate prior to the CLA being calculated in, according to Act 127, is capped at a 5% increase through FY29. That's a relief for our tax paying base because that's a cap, right? That's saying it's not gonna go above the 5% for, for spending. Um, and so that's a really good thing for the next five years. So this is in place for five years until F fiscal year 29. The ed fund, the education fund, will make up the difference between what we pass as a budget and what that 5% cap is. So they'll pull that in every district from the education fund, according to this law. In order to get our tax rate in fiscal year 30 to a reasonable and responsible fiscal number, we will have to continue to 
um, decreased spending for the five years so that in fiscal year 30, we are not really hit with an enormous tax bill. We think <laughs> that could change. Um, the cap, this 5% cap will hold and we can rely on it as long as our, our equalized pupil or our long-term weighted average daily membership is below 10% increase from the previous year. Should we come over a 10% equalized, spend, equalized pupil spending, the secretary can, it's not the secretary shall, but the secretary of education can look at our budget and what we've spent to determine if it's excessive spending or not. Whether or not that will happen is up to a big debate in all kinds of forums right now where superintendents live. Um, but it is in the law that the secretary can make that determination if we come in over 10% equalized people spending. Um, if they determine, if we say we're, we're doing it, we're coming in over 10% and the secretary determines that it's excessive, then our taxpayers will be on the hook for the typical tax rate that is not capped at 5%. The cap goes away. And that's significant. So the tax increase will be significant. Um, so this is kind of the biggest slide and thing to understand in this presentation right here. Um, and I know I've had to explain it out loud about a lot at this point, and then still I'm trying to figure out the best way to explain it, but it's just kind of to get it down in bullets and go for it. I'm actually gonna ask Christina to talk to this slide. One of the things I asked Christina to look at, and I wanna say, to make it really clear, we are making a lot of assumptions here because so many numbers can change between now and five years from now. You know, we could have middle income housing projects go up at the Elks Club or wherever and, and lots of families move into that and increase our enrollment. We, we don't know what's gonna happen in five years. The legislature could change this law in five years and change the weights. Uh, like the dollar yield could do whatever the dollar yield, we don't know what the CLA is gonna do. So I just wanna put that out there that there are so many assumptions that Christina made on this slide that, and at the same time, I still believe it's an important slide to show simply because um, it shows that over five years, we can't keep spending the way we're spending and have a responsible tax rate at the end of five years. So Christina, you wanna explain what you did in your nice, loud teacher voice? Um, all right, good evening, everyone. Um, so in this slide, what I did, I, I just projected that we were gonna add $2 million to our, our general fund budget for each year. Um, the blue line shows you currently from FY24 to 25 what a 5% cap tax rate would look like. So that's, um, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's what the blue line shows you is just our 5% cap if we were able to, to stay under the 10% ed spending per um, equalized pupil. Uh, the orange line mm -hmm shows the new weights. Um, so again, I made a lot of assumptions here. I'm assuming what we're adding to the budget based on salary, benefits, inflation, um, and those types of things. Also, I'm assuming the CLA, I'm assuming the dollar yield. Um, every factor in here is an assumption. <laughs> um, but just based on a trend of adding $2 million each year, we get to FY30 and our, we won't have that cap, that protection. So our tax rate would jump from $1.62 to $1.84. And that's a pretty significant jump um, compared to our trending tax rate increases. Okay, we'll keep going. Nick, since you're standing, can you go shut the back door for me? Thank you. So what does this all mean? And again, I want to just reiterate and reiterate and reiterate. We are making some assumptions here that could change. Um, they could change for the better. They could change for the worse. They could change. But one of the things that uh, Christina, Mia, and Jim and I decided very early because of the impact this has on our, on our taxpaying base, on our staff, on the school board, and what the discussion is going to be, 
we want to be as transparent as we possibly can be from the get-go with this conversation and get as much input as possible so, so this body can make really good decisions. With that, we are making assumptions, okay? So I, we're making projections off of our assumptions. A lot of our assumptions are pretty good assumptions. When, I've, when I say we've lived this for three weeks, we've lived this for three weeks. They're pretty good assumptions. Yeah, I just as a matter, the budget process is always filled with assumptions. There are, there are numbers that can change. Yeah, we do our best. Historically, we've done a pretty good job of yeah. arriving at assumptions that are within, within the range of, of where the true numbers end up being. Yes. So one assumption we are making, um, and the assumption is coming from direction from both colleagues at the tax department and uh, the VASBO, which is the Vermont's Business Managers Association, who work directly with the Agency of Education's Finance Department. Um, we're making an assumption of a dollar yield, which has a significant impact on our budget and our tax rate, of $9,687. To give you a sense, last year's dollar yield was 15,400 and something dollars. Okay, so that's, this is a precipitous drop in the dollar yield. Something that I've been superintendent for six years, that type of drop has never happened. It typically increases, quite honestly. Um, so this is a much different drop, but this is what they've told us to plan with, is this type of drop. Um, the dollar yield, we're supposed to get a notice from the tax department on December 1st. Uh, sometimes it's a couple days late, but our first board meeting in December is December 6th. So fingers crossed we'll have a realer number, is that a word, realer? A more real number um, for that board meeting on December 6th. Um, so that's when we're supposed to get it, but right now we're making an assumption here. Libby, one more time, can you just repeat what was the dollar yield? In the previous year? 15,400 and change. Thanks. Um, okay. So we could increase our budget by $2 million. You heard Christina reference that number. That reference wasn't just pulled out of the sky. Um, we need an anticipated approximate $2 million to represent just the salary and benefits increase for our staff for the staff at Montpelier Roxbury. That's of course an approximation. We don't know who's leaving, we don't know who's coming, um, that kind of thing, but it, with our staff we have now, it's approximately $2 million for just salary and benefits. No other programmatic shifts, no other increases to the budgets, but salaries and benefits. We do have the solid increase in benefits for next year from VHI. Not solid, but we have anticipated from VHI, which is the letter we use, and the increase to all of our benefits here in the district is 16.4% increase, 5% increase from last year. That's the largest increase it's been in six years. Um, so it's a significant increase. Um, we knew, we, we anticipated and we expected from three years ago that we would need to move about 4.5 FTE from, that are currently in grants, um, ESSER grant being one of them, Medicaid fund balance grant being another one. We knew we'd have to move those positions into our local budget this year. This is not a surprise and wasn't unexpected and we had planned for it. It's approximately $500,000 and we had a plan to do that. However, there's still this $2 million, that, you know, it's like decrease $5 million to get to the $2 million. Um, if that 500, makes 500,000 to get to the 2 million, if that makes any sense. Um, but I did wanna just put that out there in terms of transparency. This was an expected thing we were going to have to do in our district. So with the projections, and that's underlined, and if I, I should have put it in like a bigger font, with projections and assumptions of the dollar yield and the CLA, the ed spending per modeled long-term weighted average daily membership or equalized pupil, the increase would be beyond that 10% if we put in two million extra in our budget. And just to reiterate, the two million is not adding, it is keeping pace. Right, right. <clears throat> it's not, we wouldn't be adding any programs or anything. It's, programs, it's, it's simply know, what people, we've promised. It's what we've promised. It's, you know, it's, it's raises, it's increased in, in benefit costs, uh, and it's, you know, moving some positions from one source of revenue to another. Yep. 
It's not adding anything new, but it's also not taking anything away. Exactly. Right. It's just yes. presenting yeah. what we have. Yeah. It's status it's, quo. It's moving forward at the status quo. Right. So in in red there up on the slide, um, that could and capitalized could trigger the potential meeting with the Secretary of Education regarding excess funding if we came in at that number. The projected equalized residential tax rate, which is the tax rate before the CLA is factored in, could be capped at 5% if it's not determined excessive. If it's excessive, it also could be 84.217% in actuality with our assumptions. So that means that difference between the 5% and the 84% would be made up by the Ed Fund. Every district would be doing that. Okay, so like every district in the state would be pulling more from the Ed Fund than we typically do. If, and that's a big if, that is bolded and it's underlined, <clears throat> if MRPS is determined to have excess spending, then the cap is lifted and the projected residential tax rate with no cap and after CLA could be very, very large. For Montpelier, it could be 108% or $3,650 increase on a $300,000 house. In Roxbury, it would increase 84.21% or $3,290 on a $300,000 home. It's significant if, if the secretary would come in and determine our spending excessive. And that's a big if, right? It's a gamble. So this I just is, want to <clears throat> clarify that that is not taking into consideration the homestead. Right? No, it's not taking no. into consideration the hometown practice yeah. property, which you know the percentage of voters in Montpelier, don't you? Yeah. Totally put you on the spot there. I'm sorry. Okay. Blame it on me. <laughs> <clears throat> And for some perspective, the increase on a $300,000 home last year was like $280. Yeah. Yes. So for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Montpelier, um, you know, 1,895 homesteads, 1,200 are um, income sensitized when they pay their taxes. Can you repeat that? Sorry. About two-thirds. Yeah, two-thirds in Montpelier. And then for Roxbury, uh, there are 222 homesteads, and 140 of them qualify for income sensitivity. And that's where you receive a credit on your tax bill based on your income. I'm sorry, what was my Montpelier was two thirds. So another scenario um, is to increase our budget by approximately $800,000, assuming the dollar yield, assuming a lot of things. Another way to put that, though, is that if we need $2 million for our salaries and benefits, things we've already promised to our staff, we'd have to decrease our budget by $1.2 million. This would not cover our projected costs for salaries and benefits for our staff currently employed at MRPS. And we, the leadership team, would need significant direction from the school board to determine how to target that decrease. Um, if we did this, then the ed spending, this, I played with the math until I got the closest to 10% I possibly could without going over. And we're around 800,000 there. We come in under the 10%, so we'd be kept protected by the cap. They would not look at our budget at all. They wouldn't have a reason to. And, we, and so it would be capped at 5%, which is why you don't see the third row there, because it's a moot point. Um, we, it wouldn't come into fruition with this particular scenario. Now, I want to reiterate, though, like the, the message that is very easy to get from this is, oh, we need to cut 1.2 million. A lot of assumptions are in this slide. There's an assumption on a dollar yield we don't know. There's an assumption on the final LTW we don't know. There are some assumptions here that we still don't know. Um, however, they, the assumptions we've made are pretty good assumptions. And they're not exact, but they're pretty good. Um, so, if, so to get to as close to the 10% as possible, we'd, we'd, have to signif we'd have to reduce our budget. That, that is a statement that I feel very confident making. 
Um, so I, Christine and I are suggesting a timeline revision in the, I guess it's the board policy for budget, yeah. for budget development. Um, typically, just so the audience knows who don't live and breathe this stuff, we typically present our first initial budget in the first board meeting in December to the school board. We provide a second draft based on the feedback we received from the school board in the second meeting of December. We hold a public forum in the first meeting in January for anybody to offer feedback. And then the board votes on the budget final, like what gets sent to the printers, the second meeting in January. That is the typical process. Um, we are suggesting this instead. This is, a, this is a budget meeting we don't normally have in our budget cycle, so it's kind of kicking off now. The next board meeting on the 15th, we'd like to give the board and the community time for this to percolate and time for people to think on it and provide the board with feedback. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead with our fall data presentation on the 15th of November. The first board meeting in December, we would recommend that the board have discussions regarding the direction that they would like the administration to take in generating that first draft of the budget and then presenting that first draft on the 20th um, I am also anticipating, as our Jim and Mia, that uh, the board may need some additional meetings to have discussions with the public in between those meetings in December and possibly January. We need to have a budget finalized and approved by the board by January 7th, the January 17th board meeting. So Christina can get it prepared and sent to where it needs to go. And that date isn't even our policy. That's law, right? Yeah. To get it in time for town meeting? Right, you have to have it 30 days. How many taxpayers have to have it in their hands 30 days before town meeting yeah. by statute? So right now, um, in this moment, I'm going to reiterate what Jim said earlier. This is not the meeting to discuss strategy. Um, this is a meeting to ask questions and try to understand a very complicated law and its impacts on MRPS. I think all of us need to recognize that everybody in the room and on Zoom and who will watch this at a later date uh, recognize that this is not easy and it will not be easy for the foreseeable future unless we have made drastic mistakes, <laughs> which I'm not gonna say that that can't happen. Um, educating our communities uh, regarding the influence of Act 127 will be paramount in the coming years and this is the time right now to ask questions. And if Christina and I can't figure out the answers, we will certainly find them for us, for the, the community and the board. And with that, I hand it to you, Jim. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take public comment uh, and then have board discussion. Uh, could I see a show of hands of people who wanna make comment in the room? Two, three, for Christine, Christine, can you can slide back over. And on <coughs> Zoom, I see on Zoom, one. one. So we've got five. Nope, two. Two, six, seven, okay. eight. Any others on online? I'm going to give a quick call because it'll influence how much time I give people. Eight total. And anyone else want to give public comment? Going once. I mean, you have a question about something in the presentation. Come on up and ask it yeah. for public comment. Yeah. So nine. OK, let's do a minute each. Uh, let's start in the room first. Would you like me to answer questions as they come, or, or attempt to answer questions if I can if they come, or would you like me to write them down and then answer them all together? Let's answer them as they come. Yeah. OK. All right. That way they're fresh and people don't need a reminder. Yes. All right, so I am going to time folks. Um, I'm going to, at least for the people in the room, I'm going to give two fingers for 10 seconds, one finger for five, so that way it doesn't surprise you and you can wrap up. Uh, mm -hmm. And just form a queue and, um, and go. Joe? Yeah. 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 One minute, you said, Jeff? One minute. Okay. Pardon the speed with which I'm going to deliver this. <laughs> you can always send it to the board afterwards, um, Joe, yep. too. So good evening. I'm Joe Carroll. I'm the president of the Montpelier Roxbury Education Association, our local teachers union. As we begin this long, complicated, and challenging process around <laughs> how to deal with the budget constraints we're facing, 
the MREA wants to emphasize three things that we hope will be at the forefront of your thinking. First, the MREA as a stakeholding group in the school district and in our community is looking forward to a transparent and democratic process. If really hard decisions have to be made, those decisions we hope will be made in partnership with those whom the decisions affect. Achieving the best possible outcome from this situation necessitates that all school workers, students, community members, and stakeholders have a seat at the table when these decisions are made. In other words, nothing about us without us. Second, we also want to emphasize a reality that needs to be centered no matter where this conversation goes. Students are coming to our schools with many complicated and hard to meet needs. Meeting those needs is very, very difficult. A quick look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or other data points. Just, just went off, so please finish up, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, as the conversation unfolds, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to recognize that cutting any position that directly faces students and meets students' needs might be short-term solution to a budget crisis, but would be a very serious mistake long-term. Finally, given how complicated financing education is, we invite the board to a longer-term discussion with the union on how we can advocate to the state for a more equitable funding of schools. I'm sorry I went over. Thanks, Joe. Oh, no. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next, in the room. Okay, Peter. Hi all, Peter Sterling from Montpelier. First, thank you so much for serving on the board. I know it's a lot of time and a lot of work and really appreciate everything you're doing to keep our schools running. Just a comment, um, we, you know, it's important to get good information out there and I know you all are trying and in this, in this slide, the increased two million, I know you referred to it verbally, but we should not be talking about what a potential rate increase looks like for a home without mentioning whether these people are income subsidized or not. Like someone's gonna see this number and get really upset if they're low income. And mm -hmm. we just gotta be super clear on that because once numbers like this get out there, they start circulating all over the place and people get really upset about it. And let's yeah. just be super, if you can just be as clear as possible, I think it would take down everyone's anxiety a lot. Not everyone's paying enough. So look, again, thank you so much for doing all of this. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank uh, next please. Morgan. I just have a, a question about the Act 127 cap page of the presentation with the two, uh, two points. The long-term weighted average daily membership per pupil needs to be below 10%. I'm not clear about 10% of what? It's 10% increase from the year before. Okay, so the budget generally increases every year, but if the increase is below 10%, I'll You're good on, on the that. cap. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Ava? Dear school board, school board, thank you for doing what you do. My name is Nathan Suter, um, a parent of two students in the district, among other things. Um, I think my main question is that I'm assuming that this law is an attempt to rebalance based on needs as though in Vermont, every Vermont child is our child and we should distribute resources appropriately to their needs? Okay. So one implication is that we have been benefiting for years from the waiting and that it's our turn <laughs> or something like that. Is that accurate? Uh, not, not the latter thing. That's editorializing. But this is a rebalancing of how the statewide funding of education is used? That is accurate. I don't know if you can say we've been benefiting benefiting from it. I don't know if that's an accurate statement or not. It's just the way it was, you right. know. So it's right. just the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a it's a redistribution. I mean, I think there's a question of whether the redistribution means that the the districts that don't benefit from this need to be put in a tough spot, or we just need to rethink how we spend education period but that's a question for the legislature okay and then um and quick because you're yeah you're i'd be interested to hear you all reflect on what other factors can we influence how can we you know what would an enrollment increase mm -hmm. do etc yeah thanks again great thanks um next please in the room any others in the room i think there were yeah Tyler. <coughs> Uh, Tom Frazier again. Um, 
I just wondered whether or not there was any thought of doing the uh, uh, renegotiating a contract with the union to um, affect savings. Uh, in most industries, as big as an education industry, they do that in a private se private sector. Um, I realize you can't just lay off a bunch of people like they do at X or someplace else, but um, usually they ask the union as a buy-in for the cost of doing business. And maybe that's something, I mean, I I just quickly perused the salaries in the, in the school district. I don't think anybody's starving. Uh, it might be a good idea rather than having to close facilities or, or cut programs. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and, and again, we, we have, you know, this is, this is the information session. This is not, I'm back, nothing as of yet has been put on the table specifically. Yeah. yeah. I understand. Yeah. Uh, James? I don't know, to my hand, so if there's others. Oh, uh, I don't know. If there, are there others, or? Um, it's yours. It'll be very yeah. quick. And it's okay. really just a question about where we can send questions. Um, I have a several I wouldn't want to bother folks tonight with, but is there a formal process or place to send questions on the process? Is it simply sending to the school board email? I would send it to the school board email and then I'm on that as well. And if the school board doesn't mind, if it's a question I can answer quickly, I will answer. Yeah. I will answer it. Okay. And I should put, I, for me personally, it's, I wouldn't be expecting an answer directly from you. It's more putting them into the hopper. If I can answer it, I will. Future. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Thank you. Uh, moving to. Uh, the screen. Um, uh, let's just do it in order. Uh, Jacqueline, please. And again, introduce your, yourself for the, the camera. And um, when you're ready, why don't you appear with the mute button off and I'll hit the timer. Go for it. Do you have audio? We're not getting sound. I don't think she's talking yet. No. Jacqueline, Jacqueline, did you Fraser. hear that yeah. he called you to speak? <laughs> oh. Looks like her mouth is moving. Yep. Um, why don't we Why don't we go to Lisa and see if we can? Um, and then we'll come back. Um, see if it's anything at your end. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for taking this. I have two questions for you all. First of all, will there be um, any public availability of the questions that other people send in in the answers, or will those just go into like a private discussion so that we, other people won't know the answers? I'm saying if you know, 20 people write 20 questions. Will you post those questions and the answers to them is one question. And the second question is, um, if our, our fund balance has been growing and growing and growing, and we know that 1.9 is set aside for the track, of course, and it came in way over budget. The last budget before the flood was close to 2.4 million. Can, is it safe to assume that the track on the is now um, that money can be spent to alleviate tax burden, or will you be going ahead with your track project? Thank you. Um, on the first one, I think we definitely want to. We haven't figured it out, but we definitely want to get as many questions and answers out in public as we can that are appropriate. Again, we haven't you know made any decisions. This is new. I think it's pretty safe to assume that um, that. $2 million is certainly going to be a big part of the discussion to alleviate this burden. Um, but that's a decision to be made later. But I would be surprised if it was not made. So, um, yes. Uh, Zach. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the MRPS staff and the school board for facilitating this meeting tonight. Um, I'm Zach Porter, and I'm a Montpelier resident with a uh, Union Elementary uh, uh, student at the 
for a daughter. And um, I am just wanting to ask a question, which is that, you know, the presentation tonight, and I realize that, you know, there's probably going to be more uh, kind of strategic considerations brought up at future meetings. So maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, the way that the presentation was given tonight, and I don't mean to presume that this was intentional at, at all, um, it, it put the focus on the teacher or faculty or staff, you know, pay increases as kind of where the issue is, that that's the money that we need to be looking at here. And I guess I just wanted to, to put the question out there, are there other areas where we could save money so that we don't have to, uh, you know, hurt our amazing school staff um, in any way? And uh, I would just, you know, like, to see at a future meeting um, options that could save our school system uh, the potentially necessary funds that we need to save, but that don't come out of the really important uh, salaries and benefits for our, our great staff. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make a quick comment on that. Um, I think the $2 million are presented as just a reality of kind of where of the costs that we have already committed to. I mean, I want to say I was part of the negotiating team that worked with with, with Joe and the teachers. Uh, we as a board are very proud of the uh, the raise we gave teachers. Uh, we thought it was very due. They are the uh, the bread and butter of this district. Uh, they, make, uh, they make it tick. They educate our kids. Uh, we value that. That is simply a number we are committed to, but we honor that commitment, and that is a commitment that the board uh, was very glad to make. Our, our teachers got um, a bump. It is very well deserved. Uh, it was probably very long overdue, especially as we saw the, the heroic efforts they did during COVID. Uh, so that number was not meant to present that as a problem at all, just simply a, a, an obligation we have and a number we need to take care of. But. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of all the board members when I say we are we are very proud of uh, the commitment we made to our teachers, and they deserve every every cent. If I may jump back in just to say I was not trying to uh, suggest there was intent in any way yeah. to put a spotlight on that, so I didn't I didn't mean for it to come across that way. I just want to make sure that all of these potential options are considered in the future. So that's all. Thank you. Okay. No thanks, Zach. Um, Someone whose name is not on the screen, but uh, is not Jack. Zamata, okay, thanks. Zamata? Um, yes, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I wanna just bring up a, that because there's a lot of assumption, it's really hard to sit through a presentation that is based on a lot of assumptions. And I know that some of it is out of your hand. And I just really want to encourage a transparent democratic process as well. Um, I am thinking a lot about the teachers, but also thinking a lot about Roxbury students who some of these policies or like these laws are also for them. So I just want to, um, I'm a little concerned that that's where we're going to jump and that we're talking a lot about basic assumptions. And I know you're not bringing a proposal today, but I will really love to see um, a process that is transparent for all of us, educators and students and, and uh, families, and also to ensure that uh, the, the presentations are a little more plain language for some of us that don't understand a lot of the, the numbers and things. I think it's still up, it's still up here, and I think I, um, I think we can benefit from lowering that threshold. And I just want to appreciate all the, the educators that work so hard for our students and um, hope that they are untouched. Thanks. Okay. Um, Jacqueline, have you, you know, if you fixed your audio problem? Do we know? If... Oh, no. We can't hear you. Are you muted? Ja Jacqueline, can you hear us? So yeah. my Anna behind the scenes thinks that you, when you connected to Zoom, you didn't connect to the audio part. So can you allow Zoom to connect to your microphone? That might be the problem. 
Or just sign out and sign back in. Yeah. You, usually, you usually hover over the controls, and at the bottom left, there would be like a microphone looking thing and a little arrow, and you would click on the arrow, and it would tell you, you know, you would have options of how to join audio. She's signing Okay. Put a question in the chat, or just address the board, the email the board. Yeah, you can email the board, or and we could read it out loud, even. Yeah, let's see. She's gonna. Okay. Anna seems to think it's an odd issue on her end, <clears throat> for sure. Okay. So she's gonna try to call back in. Sometimes see. it's headphone related too. I think we can start the board discussion, and okay. then if, uh, if Jacqueline comes back in, then we can certainly yeah, have her jump on. Uh, so not sure how to start this. Um, yeah, I, one thing I don't think you want to get too much into problem solving. What I'd like to direct is kind of more things we would like to see from the administration in terms of scenarios uh, uh, for next time. and. Um, and also just overall thoughts on kind of where we are. Is she back? Yeah, I, okay, I saw connecting to audio, so. Yeah, but can you hear me? Yes. There you are. Jesus, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, you know, supposed to be tech savvy. My generation is a little younger. I've done this a hundred times. Sorry, I'm at my son's gymnastics meet or gymnastics class. My question is about the timeline. Why is it so short? And is there any, you know, um, kind of pre pre existing scenario in which legislature has reconsidered a timeline. I mean, because it just seems really tight. Yeah, you're you're right. The by statute we have to have the budget to our voters 30 days before town meeting day. Um, so that's the reason why and it has to Christina get the board votes on it, Christina gets it, has to put it together for the tax office. <laughs> I'm looking, <laughs> um, and that, and so there's time. There needs there needs to be a few days for that to occur. Um, so that's why that's in statute. We can't change that. But assuming that other communities are having this same kind of uh, shock scenario, I'm, I'm assuming that across Vermont, every other superintendent is like, "What is happening? Is there no way that we can, as a community or group, go back to ask for more time or a way to?" This is a big cut, and it's not just us. You know, we're not alone. You're right on that. We are not. We are not the only community or school district who is um, influenced in this way. So um, you are right on that. And I think Jim has already <clears throat> asked our legislators to come meet with us. Yeah, no, I've, I've asked our legislators to meet with us. Um, I mean, I, the way I would take it, I urge everyone in the room. You, you know who our legislators are. If, if you want their names, you can email me. I'll provide them to you. <laughs> uh, I hope to find today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, to, to solve for the kids. Yeah, uh, it, it's a timeline we have to work with unless people who are not us change it. Uh, so I think that, that we need to assume that that this is the timeline we need to operate under. You know, as, as Libby showed, uh, the consequences for potentially thumbing our nose at, at this are huge. Um, and I definitely agree with Peter's point that there are a lot of people who uh, are income sensitized and, and the ultimate number won't hit all of them, but a number will hit most and a large number will hit a good number. Um, and that's, that's a lot of money to make a statement. So um, that's certainly something we could do, but um, the, you know, we're, we're playing with, with people's money who is not our own. Um, and, and that's that's a big deal. So I would certainly urge everyone to, to reach out to uh, the legislature and let them know that this is a statewide problem that's, um, I'm not sure, reflexive of what this law was, was intended to do. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to make a suggestion yes. for how to 
manage the board discussion, which is maybe just like start at one end and give everybody a chance to ask any questions they currently have, and then maybe if Kristen asks the same question I have, I you I, you skip me. Um, but just to like, mm -hmm. we all, I'm sure we all have questions. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, go on down the line. Start yeah, let's just do top top questions and 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 reactions, and then we can do a little more round robin. So. Um, start with Kristen. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's been a hard week. I think everybody uh, up here, I think our leadership, Libby, the, uh, it just, it's been a really hard hit um, in the last week just trying to integrate this information. I'm feeling for all of you and the mind-bending nature of uh, school budgets is really challenging. And then, you know, with this added in, it's um, even that much more complex. Um, I would wonder what analysis can be done in terms of what exists in any and all rainy day funds that we have um, while maintaining our fund balance that's required by our policies. But just, you know, could we analyze our budget and see where do rainy day funds exist and what do they amount to and how do they, um, how do they measure up to the savings that we think we need to achieve at this point based on all the assumptions? Um, I would also wonder, and I think it would be helpful to us and, and likely the public, just in terms of when we can uh, expect certain assumptions to solidify, um, when we know we're actually, when we're dealing with real numbers. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about cuts, but um, I think when we have more solidity around those numbers would be really helpful. Um, and yeah, I think there's just like a lot of shock and awe here, and I think that as a board, I mean, I can recall when we had uh, the consortium of folks that came to us about this act, and that I think we all believed in it in spirit and concept, and I think we voted to actually join that group, and I think we do uh, very much believe that, you know, equity should be front and center in terms of our educational priorities, um, you know, being from Roxbury and you know, I think the big elephant in the room is certainly, you know, what is the fate of RBS? This has been on people's minds for since the beginning of the merger and leading up to the merger. And I think that the idea that that could be considered uh, as, as a viable pathway and that we are looking at a potential timeline of, I mean, really, we're talking about six months to cooking a budget. And if that could be something that's considered and de decided upon for our community, it feels outrageously fast. Uh, and I, I don't believe we can have an adequate process um, that involves, you know, community engagement. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think oftentimes, you know, there's, there's decision A and there's decision B, and the best decision often, you know, lies somewhere between C and Z. And so I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, this incredibly quick timeline is going to undermine uh, the outcomes, and I think it's not how this board likes to do business. I also understand we have some very significant possibly repercussions if we don't um, comply with the law in, in their time frame. Um, but, you know, I appreciate it. I think it was Joe's comment. Is there something that we can collectively do um, on, behalf of, um, on behalf of the district? Uh, I find that it's very important right now for us to reach out to their legislators. I, I do not believe that <laughs> You know, if we were to talk school closure uh, for the community of RVS, and I know we're not getting into um, so, you know solutions and strategies tonight, but it's an elephant in the room, and I feel it needs to be addressed, and I don't think that we have time to waste. Um, but if that is a potential consequence, I think our legislators need to be aware that the act uh, may have a very unintended consequence, even just for consideration. But they need to be aware. Of, of that potential. And I think it's a disservice to them to not inform them of it. So I think for now, I'll leave it at that and pass the torch. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I had the benefit of peppering about a half hour's worth of questions on Libby right before the meeting. So, uh, so, so um, yeah, I, I want to reiterate. So one thing, I actually I think we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty which is different than assumptions. Um, and the, I, I, I think it's really important to not act too quickly and to not make big decisions with so much uncertainty in the air. Um, the, the largest being the legislature. Um, our senator, um, Andrew Perklick, is on the Ed Committee. Um, and the, the 
the, the law is a product of the legislature. The legislature changes its mind all of the time, and it's influenced by it, its constituents. And so I just want to reiterate the importance of communicating to our legislators, um, particularly those on the Senate and House Education Committees, about the potential impact of Act 127. And to go back to the uncertainty thing, the, the uh, Libby, we're not the only ones. You mentioned there's a bunch of other districts, big districts in the state who are dealing with the same issue. Um, who, again, are telling their uh, constituents the exact same thing. Um, and so I think it's important that, that we recognize that, that the act as it is now is not what it's going to be necessarily in one or five or ten years. Um, and so it's, it behooves us to, to influence the direction. Before you, you go, can, Mia, yeah. Kristen did have a question in there oh, around uh -huh. um, when will numbers solidify. Right, yeah. Right. So I just want to make sure that that gets out there. So Christina has all of those dates. Yeah, good. Hey, what um, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier, we'll get a, a yield notice on December 1st. And they can change that yield, and they usually do by the end of the legislative session in May. So we'll have a pretty good idea at the beginning of December. Again, likely to change by May. The CLA, but I want to I want to reiterate on that. That is always an assumption the board makes when developing a budget yeah. because it is not <coughs> solidified in law until May, which is passed after the budget after is town the meeting. Budget is so go ahead, sorry. Oh, and to add to that, in, in my 17 years of doing this, um, the yield has always gone up by a hundred, maybe two hundred dollars. The last couple of years that it's gone up. A couple thousand dollars is quite unprecedented in my experience. Um, so the fact that it's going to drop so drastically is also new to me. <laughs> um, the next factor that we look at is the pupils. And the pupils are usually given to us um, in December, but then we get version two, version three, and sometimes version four in January. <laughs> so right up to the 11th hour when we're sending it to the printer. These factors can change. Um, the next thing that we get is, well, the next factor um, is the CLA, the common level of appraisal. We get that typically around the 15th of December, right? Do I have that right? Um, <clears throat> and that will be set. Uh, that will not change, hasn't changed, unless it was a reappraisal. <laughs> 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 So this was my first year seeing a reappraisal in the middle of the, the tax year. So those are the three factors that we're waiting for, and those are the dates that we'll get them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks Christina. Um, thank you, Libby and Christina, for putting all this work together. I also want to say thank you to everyone for showing up online and in the room, because um, we asked you to be here and you showed up, and that's pretty cool. Let's go leave it at that. I have some um, numbers questions for maybe Christina, maybe Libby. If if the budget were to increase by eight hundred thousand dollars, why would that be a ten just under ten percent increase on a budget that is actually like a twenty? Six million dollar budget because eight hundred thousand dollars isn't ten percent of twenty six million. Our budget isn't twenty six million; it's twenty eight million. Okay. So eight hundred thousand is even less of a fraction of. You're thinking you have to. It's not. Oh, go ahead, Christine. Yeah, gonna, I, Christine's going to be a better person. To answer right. This. I'm, I'm asking somebody to walk me through that math. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just I mean, stay. Just stay. stay. <laughs> well, I just think um, that it's good to walk us through that because this, those, that 10% is an important 10%. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's not 10% of our budget. It's the 10% increase looking at the long-term weighted average daily membership. Right. Um, the ed spending per. Let's just say ed spending per equalized pupil. So it's that's the 10%. It's not 10% budget to budget. Right. If we looked at a increase budget to budget, just looking at the only factor that the board has control over, um, that increase 
of two million, I'm not gonna use the 800,000. Okay. Is 6.92. Right. That's the actual percentage increase, just budget to budget. Right. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that was all put out there because it's not totally reflected on this slide and it's yeah. helpful to understand why we yeah. would need to make a cut when, you know, if somebody's just looking at like, oh, you're just talking about $2 million, $2 million on a $28 million budget. Yeah, so you're taking the one factor that you're in control of, right. dividing it by our pupils, and that's the percentage that they're looking at. Um, and I would say on top of that, some communities um, talk about just the budget to budget percentage increase, mm -hmm. and they don't go through this whole exercise with right. all these assumptions. Um, so when you're reading things in the paper, you know, it's, it's important to know what percentage or what factor they're talking about, one, two, three, or four, right. <laughs> um, because it's, it's explained differently in different communities. Right. So if I'm understanding it correctly, the, whatever our budget is right now, 28 million, divided by whatever our current equalized pupils are, that's a certain number. Yep. And then for FY25, if we were to add the two million that we need to add, and then divide it by the new equalized pupil, that's a new number, and those are the percentages that we're comparing to get this, to p keep an eye on this 10%. I'm looking at Libby because it's, not exactly. it's um, we've, we've got, walked through this quite a few times. Um, it's not apples to apples, it's kind of okay. apples to kumquat, so we're just okay. trying to, uh, because the weighting is different. Um, so the, the equalized pupils that we use in this current year, 1,220, right. I'm just going to keep it a simple number, compared to the 1,146 that we have, they're not the same thing. So we can't really compare those two numbers. Okay. That number is, is gotten to by different weighting formulas. Right. Okay, I understand that. And okay. so this was the rabbit hole we went down. When I say Christine and I went down a rabbit hole today, this is it. Okay. Um, of trying to figure out exactly which number to use for the long-term weighted um, for pupil. So um, that's what we called Brad James about, who is the person to call at the Agency of Education, um, and he told us to use the number we have been using for this calculation. The, the new number, which is? The 1,146. Right. It is the long-term weighted average daily membership uh -huh. of, from FY24 multiplied by a factor to get it to apples to apples for the equalized pupil. Okay. <clears throat> And, and that in and of itself is why we need to consider such a big cut in our budget, is the, because it, it's not just the stuff that we can control, it's these other, it goes through yes. all of these different formulas. Yes. And um, that, so the, the weights and the caps are the things that Act 127 influenced, or those, those, show, those were in Act 127, right? Yes. yes. The dollar yield was not in Act 127. Correct. Is that Sorry. correct? And the dollar yield is the other, the decrease in the dollar yield is the other thing that is significantly impacting our budget mm -hmm. currently. Yes. Continue. And yes. the CLA. And, and the CLA, <laughs> okay. right. Yeah. Right, which we're expecting to not have that big of an impact on our budget. Uh, it, it's no. dropping. If we're, from capped, if we're capped, it won't have as, ma capped. as much I see. An impact. Okay. Um, the dollar yield is significantly impacted, and this was something that I don't think those of us in the field were aware of uh, when the new expecting. That's a better yeah. word. Yeah. Um, when the new weights were announced, the dollar yield to fall so so right. long, so big. Right. Um, and the dollar yield is impacted by 127. Got it. It's not. It didn't show up in the law, but it's impacted. Yeah. By 127. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, those are all of the questions I have for right now. I'm trying to wrap my head around that in a month, the administration is going to need some kind of direction from the board, and I can't quite figure out like what I need yet to know in order to be able to, as a board member, provide direction. Um, so I don't have any more questions on that front. I think I, I'll just say I definitely understand the frustration felt 
at this table and in the room and online and by the people who are watching at home. And I, I understand the, desire, the, the need and I think I agree with the need to educate our legislators about this. I don't think it is realistic to expect Act 127 to change Certainly not in time for us to establish a budget for FY25. <laughs> no. And I also think that given the purpose of Act 127 and the fact that we, as it was being um, designed, said we absolutely positively believe in the need to equitably educate every single student in Vermont, not just every single student in Montpelier Roxbury, I would caution us to, <laughs> from going to the legislature and saying you need to change this bill because it is negatively impacting us. This is really hard, but it's also the right thing to do. And so I'm not ready to like join the torches and pitchforks yet headed to the state capitol and say, this law has to change. Yeah, no, well said, Mia. I, I think it's the right thing to do. I'm not sure it's the right way to do it. I have questions Thank about, uh, I think another political problem we have, frankly, is our governor, who I don't think is going to be sad to see districts cutting from education. Um, he may have been a little smarter than the legislature was on this one, which I fear. Uh, that's a rabbit hole we can go down later. Um, I think you're right. We are stuck with one, 127. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the reality that we have. Uh, you know, in terms of things I'd like to see, and I, I say this as someone who uh, was on the merger committee, who's drawn support of the merger committee, who, um, you know, got to know members of the Roxbury community and know how important that school is to the community. But I do think we need to see some scenarios of how these cuts would look, including um, changes in facilities and also changes in, in personnel. Uh, and not just how they'd look from a monetary standpoint, but how they'd look from an educational standpoint. Because one of the places I do not want to go is um, strain from, I think, the the systems of support and the progress we've made in closing the achievement gap uh, over the last several years. Um, so my bottom line is is to ensure that we keep the systems of support, keep and, and ultimately grow the systems of support we have for students and ensure that students have the type of opportunities that they have now and with op with <coughs> options to increase. Um, I think a, a sad fact of that is is we might have to look at some facilities changes to achieve that. Um, and I'd like to see how that looks. Um, as well as, you know, other scenarios of and you know your <coughs> assessment of how that, that impacts education, including, you know, things like like you know, money we're spending on transportation. Um, not just between the two towns, but within the towns. We expanded busing in Montpelier. Is that something we could look at? Um, all tough, but I, I would like to see something like that, you know, in the next meeting or two. Uh, I mean, a, a question I have, if this is, if this is a distribution, the, the towns that are getting more money what does it look like in those towns? And then second, is there, if, if the Ed Fund, if the Ed Fund is making up the difference for us for the next few years, if we stay under 10%, that seems to be a drain on the Ed Fund. Is, is that being made up at another place? Or are we a place in five years where we've got a state Ed Fund that's grossly depleted? That is the question that I have asked several, several authorities, and nobody can answer because I have the same question. I mean, it's it's not within our purview, but it's if if this starves the Ed Fund, that's bad for the whole state, and that's yes. bad for the, the students that it's intended to help. And just going back to the system support, you know, we need to keep 
classroom teachers. Um, you know, the positions we've added that are, are, are the positions that, that benefit, I think, the students that this bill is intended to, to help. Um, and there's a real fear that, you know, if, if we're forced to starve ourselves, that's where the cuts will happen. And, and that also seems contrary <clears throat> to that. So, if, I mean, got a lot of questions for the legislature, but those are the questions I gave are the questions for us. Um, I'm happy with the intent of this law. The way it's playing out does not seem like it was well designed. Jim, can I really, really quickly jump in? Yeah. I want to say, I apologize if I incited. Put your pitchforks away, right? <laughs> Don't go down to Andrew's house just yet. I agree with everything that Jim, you just said, yeah. and Mia, I appreciate um, the passion that you, you shared. I also was a staunch supporter of 127. I think slight tweaks to the waiting can have huge impacts on district's yeah. budgets. That's that's where I think the legislature needs to think about. All right, so these weightings, maybe we can change them slightly to better reflect what it actually costs to educate all of the students in our state. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I want to just double check, as I understand it, this whole conversation really comes down to if and only if the secretary determines our spending to be excessive. And a 6% increase year to year on a budget passes the straight phase test for me as not excessive. But we're not the judge of that. And, and the, yes. cost, the cost is high, and, it, and, it's, and it's Phil Scott's AOE. This is true. Emma. Um, so I'm just trying to stay calm. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think as all of the information has sort of flooded over me, I'm just trying to remain calm and not overreact. And I want to be thoughtful and deliberate and for the board to consider like every possible path forward. Um, I really want to thank Joe Carroll and all the staff that's present in the room as well. But your eloquence really simplified something for me. You said, um, nothing about us without us. And that's been sort of resonating, in, but not in such eloquent language with me all week as I've been considering all of this. And um, you know, I, I'm really thankful for the community that turned out, because I think that's what it really, really boils down to, is we need to hear from the community. They need to understand this. And they need to signal to us what, you know, what they want, how they want us to move forward on this. Um, it's going to be a collective decision and it's going to be a collective impact. Um, I think you know we have a strong diversity, equity, and inclusion policy and, and the board stands by those values, I believe. <laughs> and we signed on as a board um, to the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity that was supporting this legislation. So we supported this legislation. But as all of the information was coming to us, uh, nobody ever said, well, just by the way, it will also increase taxes by 100%. I mean, that number was never floated to us. So I'm, you know, I think the pressure does need to be put on, back on the legis legislators, not to repeal the law <laughs> necessarily, but to figure out how, you know, how to guide the districts that are facing a 100% tax increase. <laughs> We're not. We're not. We're not. Yeah. We could. As Peter said earlier, we're not. Um, but we could. And yeah, I mean, it's, again, back to my stay calm and not overreact. Yeah. Um, but, but also not overreact in like, hey, we're going to have to cut the budget. Hey, we're going to have to close Roxbury. Right? Like, also, it won't directly cause a 100% increase to taxes for everybody necessarily. So in, in all ways, just to try to stay calm and not overreact. Um, but just you know as a board i just want to make sure that the public knows that like we were educated a little bit about this and none of these numbers were floated in the way that they're being um, presented to us tonight in fact there was an article that i read in september in vt digger um just a couple of months ago a month and a half ago where they said that the they reported that the champlain valley school district would likely face a 16 percent budget increase and so then we're looking on this on this piece of paper at a 84 percent budget increase. So I, those numbers just don't make sense to me. I don't understand how in September 
Yes, an answer. <laughs> Yeah. Those are the, two, yeah. the same two percentages. Yeah. Okay. They're budget, budget versus tax rate. Yeah, it's budget versus what you just stated was budget versus tax rate. Okay. Increases. So the the quote from VT Tigger was that their budget is increasing sixteen percent is what I heard you say. Okay. So it's budget to budget is what they're looking at. So and our that, budget would increase six percent. Our budget's only increasing six point nine percent if we were to add two million dollars. Okay. And the percentage on there is the tax rate. Increase. This is where we all need to so, go take a little math lesson. Well, that's what I was speaking <laughs> no, to that's, earlier. That's what's frustrating is because yeah. people, Every, people quote different things. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that the messaging is out there and it's easy to misinterpret um, that messaging. So that was one of my questions. Thank you. You are 100% correct with that, Emma, but it's easy to misinterpret yeah. what yeah. is coming out in the papers. Well, and and have any of the legislators responded and said, yeah, we ran the numbers and we knew that this would be the impact. And so I'm not sure that. I have not. If they did that, I want to be clear. If yeah. they did that, I have not heard them say that. Right. So I just want to be clear on that. So I'm just wondering if this might also be sort of new information for them. You know, I'm thinking this might be slapping a lot of people in the face right now. Um, so I had a question about the weights increase on the chart, the graph, and how it increases every year. So I guess I, I'm assuming that I have a misunderstanding about it. Um, but if we're losing 76 pupils because of the new weighting, how does that keep increasing every year. Are we likely to be losing pupils every year or will the impact in years two, three, four, five be less because we're we're taking that initial cut of 76 pupils this year and then in the following years it will be less? Yeah, so historically we've lost pupils, right? We always talk about declining enrollment. Um, this is a big hit, but then I think your next year it will be, you'll still see a small decrease. Um, it just won't be such a huge hit like it is now. We're in a transition year, right? So we're going from apples to cucumbers, and <laughs> that's a big change. And then when we go cucumbers to cucumbers, we're going to be a little bit better off. <laughs> so can you explain, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing the graph, but can you explain why the new weights number just keeps going up at the same rate? That's not the weight number. Oh, I'm sorry, which slide are you? It's labeled, it's orange, and it's labeled new weights. New weights. It's the tax impact yeah. of the new weights. It's not the new weights oh. going up, it's the tax impact with the new weights that would go up. But go okay, ahead, Christina. So I guess that's yeah. my question is, if we're losing the 76 pupils in the first year, why would the tax impact of the new weights go up every year at the same rate? So, with the new weights, um, I'm just increasing the budget $2 million each year. So that was one of the assumptions. Um, I'm sorry, there's three assumptions when you're looking at that orange line. There's an increase to the budget. Um, there's a change in the yield. There's a change in the CLA. Um, so your, your tax rate's going to go up every year because you're increasing your budget naturally. So what, salaries, most likely, inflation. so you'll increase our, we'll increase our budget most likely each year. The dollar yield will most likely decrease each year because mm -hmm. we're pulling from the Ed Fund, just what Jim said. And the CLA most likely will decrease because how often do we do appraisals? Every 10 years plus. Every 10 years. So the CLA will most likely decrease. When the dollar yield decreases and the CLA decreases, tax rate increases. Mm -hmm. When your budget increases and dollar yield decreases and CLA decreases, your tax rate increases. So that, that line can, will continue to increase. So what's the difference between the 5% cap and the new weights? Like what are those, why are those two numbers different? I guess the increase from FY24 to 25 is more than 5%, so that's why the orange line is higher. Um, because we benefit, so what this is really demonstrating is um, we're going to be capped at 5% for FY25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. What it demonstrates is when we go from 29 at 1.62, we're going to jump up to 1.84. and Because the cap goes away because the cap goes away. So instantly your tax rate, you have to pay what you really need to raise in taxes. So when we looked at this, um, and assuming just adding $2 million a year, um, 
in FY30, we would need to cut five million, roughly five million dollars to get the tax rate from 162 to 170 rather from, than 162 to jump way up to one eighty one dollar and eighty four cents. Does that make sense? Kind of. I might need to spend some time with this yeah. and you to <laughs> totally understand it. Um, it's, it's very complicated if, stuff. Let me say it another way. If we wanted to maintain a 5% increase in our tax rate, the very bottom number, what you get on your tax bill after all the factors are in, if we wanted to maintain just a 5% cap, because we've been doing, right. we've been capped at 5%, so right. let's just stick with that, right? Um, we would have to cut five million, uh, roughly five million dollars. Otherwise, the cap goes away. You're going to have to pay a dollar eighty-four in order to raise all that money for the budget that you've created in six years from now, which is way beyond five percent. Yes. I guess my question is, if we're if we lose the seventy-six pupils this year and we um, we increase, I forget what the percentage was, per pupil, we keep it just under that 10% per pupil. Then next year, wouldn't we like only be facing more typical numbers of loss of pupils and not in the 70s? Yes. And so true. wouldn't the loss be a lot less in the second year than this first year? Do you want to <laughs> well, the, I mean, yes, it, except that what, what I think Christina and Libby are helping us understand is one of the reasons the, the, it's not so much about the loss is less in the second year, but that the tax rate isn't going to go up so much in FY26 is because that cap is still in place. Because even though our pupils will only decrease by a small amount, from FY25 to FY26, we still have what, we still have have a quote unquote bigger budget after all of these factors are put into place than this, than um, without the cap, then like, I don't know, whoever deems is we sh the size of the budget we should have. I don't know who they are, <laughs> but um, that's, that's why the cap for this year is so important is because without it, our tax rate goes sky high. And would that not happen in year two? No, what I'm saying is it, it would if there was no cap. It won't happen in year two because there's a cap, but in order to be able to get the cap of 5%, we still have to keep the budget low like right but yeah i guess I, I guess i'm not understanding like you would imagine that the 76 pupil loss is basically one grade level in this school district that if we're losing that many students in one year that that's going to have a huge dramatic impact in the first year of this five-year plan and i'm not seeing in the numbers that reflected i of like i think one misunderstanding there is that an equalized pupil is not a kid with their butt in a seat i understand that yeah. okay <laughs> all right so like but one, still it's equivalent to right i think 76 pupils I, I, that makes i see i see now what you're asking i think what the thing is that we are not making up it unless we were to really dramatically cut our budget like right now we're talking about maybe cutting it by 1.2 million dollars in order to get to that under 10 percent mm -hmm. but because we're not doing a so, so much of like an even bigger cut than that, we still have a quote unquote gap to make up yeah. in the subsequent neck, like year two, year three, year four. That's why we, we haven't totally, we're not totally making up for the 76 losing, losing or dropping 76 pupils in one year. The cap is backing us up to keep us from real, our budget actually m matching. So if we weren't looking at the numbers with the cap, and I don't need to spend that much more time on it, if everybody else understands it, then I, we can move on. Um, but where we say, you know, capped at 5%, the, the increase of $800,000 page, right? And it says capped at 5% or a 75.71% difference. So if we weren't talking about capped numbers, would we see a huge decrease in that number in year two, three, four, five? 
depends what we do with our budget. I guess I'm trying to imagine this as like a long, it seems like a five year plan. Yes. And I'm trying to imagine it that way mm -hmm. and trying to understand what the impact is in the future years. And that's not clear to me now. And I, I'm think, seeing it for I year one. I think one of the challenges is that that five year plan, I agree with you I, that we do need a five year plan and we're making a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. in the five year plan that are hard to make right now. There's too many influences on there. Um, however, with the assumptions that we've made, it, and this is one of the reasons why it's hard for me to wrap my head around this, is because it's unfathomable to me that in five years our budget is a sixth less than what it is now. Like, that's unfathomable. I can't wrap my head around that. Um, and so... Well, it's fit. irresponsible because we wouldn't be able to right. educate the students in our district <laughs> right. the way that we really need to. Right. So that makes me question whether the first, you know, like then it, it just, that logic just tra translates to the first year also, mm -hmm. where it's like, it's irresponsible. I understand. I understand <laughs> the phases of grief that you are in right now because I have been there myself. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a phase of grief. I think it's like just logistically that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to do that for five years. Agreed. So... Well, I, th I think what it's doing is spreading one big chunk of pain over five years. Yes. Protection plan for five years. Yeah. And then, like, you know, you said it great, you know, explaining that we're being protected and buffered by that 73 people loss over five years with the cap. It's buffering us from that. Yeah. Um, you're not paying the full uh cost the full tax rate that needs to be generated to raise those taxes mm -hmm. so it's a it's a five-year protection plan and then <laughs> yeah then you'll okay. see the big hit if the waiting is the same in if five years from now the same. yeah yes yeah. of course <laughs> I'm going to, I have follow-up questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, it would take too much time. <laughs> um, I, I have spent my entire professional career for 20 years working at the agency of education and at the tax department. So I feel like I can wrap my brain around this, but I still was really surprised and disappointed when I really was digging into the actual language of the bill. Um, I do think that, and I realize we are, this is the first stage, right, of denial. <laughs> um, I think the legislature obviously had very good intentions, and frankly, in the same way that we're kind of looking at these weights and really feeling the weight of it, there are districts across the state that are celebrating that they're finally getting this acknowledgement, right? There are districts that really had very little weight for multilingual lingual learners who are who have been suffering for years. So I do understand that. So this is not a statewide angst. This is very much like some districts are very happy with the results of this, this waiting, and some are in our position. Um, I think Montpelier Roxbury uh, is being punished doubly in the language that I read in the bill. Um, I was like, well, I would think, well, we would at least get to have some of the sparsity weights or the small school weights for Roxbury School. Certainly, we fit into that category. But the sparsity is district-wide, not based on the actual school building, even though it's about geographic distance. And it also explicitly uh, says that since we did cooperate with Act 46 and voluntarily merged and are receiving the merger grant, we are not eligible to receive some of these other weights. So I think that those two things should have never been conflated. The merger act that, that we carried out six years ago that has let us have the grant has nothing to do with Act 127 of, of now. And I think that was um, a pretty terrible concession that the legislature made that I'm sure we're not the only schools. Basically, we got punished for following the rules and, um, and consolidating, and, um, and now, now we are not, therefore, eligible for some of these weights that very much should be designed for exactly a building like Roxbury that has the distance and size that, are, that these weights were designed to help. Um, I also think Montpelier Roxbury is being punished because it's sort of the reverse Goldilocks, right? We're the middle of the road as far as spending. We're the middle of the road as far as our size. We don't stand out as any of those outliers like some other districts do. So because we're like just right, we are not benefiting from these weights either. And we're also not getting, um, and we're also, it does feel punitive. 
Um, I would also say that uh, Montpelier Roxbury is also part of the Central Vermont Career Center, which I'm your representative on. I'm also a state employee, and the health insurance increase is significant and is hitting everyone statewide, and I do think that when we're looking at the salary and benefits, I think it's really important to remember that that is another, there's a huge component of that that we also don't have any control over. There's a statewide health insurance plan that we're given the number and that is the number and that is not up for negotiation and that is hitting districts across the state, not just us. Um, I'm incredibly, and if anyone's curious, the merger grant that we get is $80,000 a year. I don't know if we didn't get that, if the pupil weight would be more money, I'm assuming it maybe it wouldn't be, but that's kind of an interesting question that I kind of, I'm going to try to kind of figure out because I do think that those two things should have been kept completely separately and that because we followed the merger process correctly and voluntarily, we're now not eligible for some of these weights. Um, and the last thing I think that is really scary is the secretary discretion on excess spending. The secretary of education position is a political appointee. Um, the language I just double checked um, allows the secretary, if they do find that, um, and it's very sort of um, up for interpretation language that it was for good cause or not for good cause that they that a district went over the spending, then a committee of business managers and superintendents would actually review and judge their colleagues. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be on that committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not and I'm so not Christina that feels incredibly. Um, unhelpful and wasteful and politicized and um, against the spirit. Um, one last thing, and I realize this is not a, these are not questions, but um, I kind of might have a question when I'm finished my <laughs> statement. Um, and then the last thing is, is just, um, I'll see now I lost my train of thought. <sighs> this is very upsetting. Um, where was I? Merger grant. Tax Rate Review Committee, um, okay. Politicized. Politicized. Um, health insurance. All right, sorry, I lost yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> you, had a, you had a good run there. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. You said you might have a question. Yeah, I, I, um, I, one of my questions was about the merger grant, so I was able to find that in our budget numbers. I. I'm dumbfounded that the yield is anticipated, and I know that this is like I should understand, but to go from 15,000 to 9,000 is like a massive statewide impact, and I just don't, I don't understand why that number would change that significantly. My understanding of it, and I could be wrong, is that one, there's going to be more long-term weighted average daily membership, more equalized pupils. Um, pulling from the education fund. Okay. And then the uh, second factor is the the behaviors of districts oh, who are going to be capped at 5%. All of us, regardless of whether you're advantaged or disadvantaged, could be capped at 5%, right? The, that makeup that we're pulling from the Ed Fund to get the rest of our operating bu budget from, that's going to, just like what Jim said, deplete the Ed Fund, which the dollar yield will be closer to a dollar. Um, yeah. by doing that. So okay. that's my understanding of it, which is enough to be dangerous, but not truly wrapping my head around it. Okay. Thank you. And your, the behavior was my last and final. Um, the Vermont education property tax system is considered an incredibly fair and equitable way of doing this. Vermont is like lauded for having a statewide education property tax system. But the legislature has added these um, incentives and penalties to so many degrees in order to try to manipulate certain behaviors um, for districts to make dis spending decisions or to be disincentivized from making spending decisions um, that really so much of it every year feels more and more out of our control. So, um, you know, so for example, it's, it feels really strange to me that there was an incentive to consolidate and merge and now there's an uh, incentive to reward or to change the weights for some of the districts that, that didn't do that, but then penalize the ones that did, even if they otherwise fall under those weights. So the, the layers of what we as a board and a district actually have the ability to impact is getting smaller and smaller every year. And I, I, would, like to, um, I would like to advocate to the legislature to stop um, using these 
various incentives and penalties to try to adjust behavior, but rather be more straightforward about the goal we're actually trying to achieve. Um, the weights are absolutely meant to direct the resources appropriately, but when you, I think the 5% is a concession to districts like us that we're gonna lose out in this. I think that was what that was. It's like, well, we'll throw them a bone and say they won't get penalized too much or it'll happen over five years, which we'll happily take. But again, there are very few parts of this budget that we can change. And I feel as a Montpelier resident for 20 years and a parent of a student who's now been at three of the four schools in this district, that this district does not excessively or irresponsibly um, provide services to our students. I think we're very um, responsible and very much middle of the road as far as our size and our spending. And, and I, I really feel like we operate under no frills. So I'm, I'm disappointed that we are being, I feel, penalized for that Goldilocks line we are threading where we're, we're just right. And that's not working for us. And now I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, no, th thank you. I, I want to echo that. I mean, that's that's my sentiment. I, um, I mean, I strongly support the goal of this bill, and and I know that there are districts out there that need more support from the state, and I'm glad they're getting it. But I also feel we've been an extremely responsible district, uh, both in terms of our spending and also in terms of of really building support systems for the students that need it and for the students that I think this bill is trying to benefit, um, and you know the. The sausage making of this bill uh, to to put a district like ours in the position we're in uh, seems like a, a very unfortunate and sorry result. Um, and I know we can't control it, but um, it's it's not where we, we should be. It's where we are, but it's not where we should be. Brett. I've heard a lot of people making the case, a very strong case, that our spending is in no way excessive. In no way could it be considered excessive. Um, and, you know, there's nothing in this presentation about the next five years. It's got, it's, it, there's a little bit on the graph, but I heard last week at the end of this, we're looking at a $7 million cut. Now I'm hearing it's a $5 million cut. A lot of numbers are changing as this understanding evolves. Um, you know, are we basing the 5 to 10 percent on what our equalized pupils were in 2024, or are we basing the 5 to 10 percent equalized pupilized um, calculation based on numbers that are where we've lost 74 students? I don't, I don't know whether those are whether you. And I hear that there was a factor in there, so I guess it's kind of the same if that factor is involved. Um, <clears throat> but if we're looking at, you know, one to one point two million dollars needed every year for the next five years, why on earth are we talking about dramatically harming my town on year one in a two month in two months? Two months, we're going to talk about killing Roxbury Village School irreparably. It's never going to come back. In two months, when we're talking about dealing with a problem that is prolonged over five years, we're going to have pain over five years. Why would we consider closing a school in a two-month time frame when we have to deal with equal amount of pain next year and the following year and the following year and the following year? That does not make any sense to me, except that RVS is extremely difficult. It is extremely difficult to run a school with 40 kids. It's extremely difficult to, to provide the kind of multi-tiered you know, levels of, of, of remediation. I'm sorry that my and the acronyms are not okay. flowing right now. It's really difficult to, to run that school. It's really difficult to get teachers to build the skills to teach really effectively to a one-two classroom that has some kids that are at a pre-K level and some kids that are in a fourth and fifth grade level. Those are really hard things to do. And so the other, the other factor is there's a greater proportion of kids in Roxbury that need more support than there are in Montpelier. There are a number of kids in Montpelier that need additional support, but there's a greater proportion of that 40 
that need more support in Roxbury. And so when you look at the scores in Roxbury, it's going to stand out. And what would happen if those kids were at Union? It would just dissolve. All of those problems would kind of dissolve. And it would look, it would look great from an academic achievement perspective. It's the, it's the lowest hanging fruit for a number of reasons. But if we pick it, it kills a community. And to do that in a two month time frame when we're talking about dramatic pain over multi years is irresponsible. And I, I think that there's a lot of factors in that that suggestion has come up. And, I, and I, it's a hard school to run, I understand that. And I don't think that it should, it should be, you know, not be a possibility. It should certainly be a possibility. If we have five years of pain, then we have five years to decide to move kids from Roxbury to Union. And maybe it's decided over one year, but over two months is unbelievable. That's that's what that's my that's my position. I just I just have to take a moment. Sorry, <clears throat> but I just want to appreciate and echo what Rhett is saying right now. I think that the amount of uncertainty that this has already just created in our community is is untenable. <laughs> um, it, this timeline, we are literally talking about seeing our first budget scenarios come before us in the beginning of December. During the holidays, everybody knows how busy you know that time of year becomes, and we're gonna in six weeks we could potentially make a decision to close a school that has an unbelievable historical value, a current value. I mean, schools, uh, the top order, of course, is to educate our students. None of us can deny that schools provide an unquantifiable value when it comes to the fabric of a community. The connections, the ability to go to your school to be seen, to be heard, to be known, to be supported. In a rural place, that is geographically dispersed and has the challenges that we do, we need a community hub. Should this process play out and we decide that that building could become something else and serve that purpose, that is one thing. But the idea that we would make this decision in six months, and I echo what Rhett says, it, it's forever. You can take that piece out, but adding it back in, I do not have much confidence that that would happen. Um, and the, the damaging effect to our community is it's it's just it's not palatable in any way, shape, or form. I think that in talking to the previous board members who were here during the merger and after the merger, there was a shared there's there is the document that I call our, our marriage contract, the merger document. Okay, that it says that after four years of the merger, the board could take a vote and vote to close the school. Okay, like we we signed on to that. However, in the time of the merger, my understanding, Jim, you're the last person standing <laughs> uh, still on the school board, and thank you, um, that also shares that you know, collective memory. But the school board members of that time recall the conversation was that we would never close that school based on budget alone. It's not written in the document, okay? But I think if we are to, to entertain this idea, we have to be able to show and ideally we would never entertain it year one, but we would have to be able to show the Roxbury community that there is an educational benefit to moving our students from Roxbury to Union Elementary School. I don't know that we can show that in a matter of six weeks with everything else going on with this quagmire. <laughs> so um, it's been a very difficult time the last five days. I am grateful, I think at a meeting, Libby mentioned Tylenol PM. I don't know what I would have done in the last five days without it. Me too. <laughs> um, I just feel that the position that we have been put in is just, it's, it's outrageous and untenable. And I feel for our districts who, in Vermont, who very much need this funding and needed it 10, 20 years ago. That is not something that I, I don't want to shun, shame, or discount that in any way, shape, or form, but this cannot be ignored that this act could kind of prioritize the decision of the closure of a school in a six week time period. And being repetitive, Lynn. Well, to summarize, <laughs> um, actually, I, I was thinking that um, we really, when we're thinking this out, it is a five year plan, right? It's not a one year plan. And so um, I think 
we're going to have to put a lot of effort into very carefully looking at how to make that work for five years. You know, we might be able to fix it year one by getting rid of Roxbury, right? But then we've got four more years where we have to figure this out. So um, I just Why want us. No, no, no. I, you know, so I just want us to be thinking long term when we look at how we're going to make this work. Jay, are you calling on me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, hi. Sorry, I'm not there. I'm pretty sick. Um, so I'm at home. Um, my name is Jake Feldman. I'm the newest member of the school board. Um, and uh, my day job <clears throat> is at the tax department doing education funding, um, among some other things. And I've been doing it for like 10 years. Um, the commissioner's letter that was mentioned earlier that comes out on December 1st, I've been putting that together for eight years. Um, I was also involved in Act 127 um, with modeling quite a bit. Um, so um, I understand this stuff pretty well. Um, and I understand the new law really well. And there's a lot of people still participating in this meeting, 65 it looks like, on, on Zoom. Um, and also maybe a lot of people in the room, not really sure. But um, I think, think that... Um, you know, um, uh, I don't think that the situation as, is as dire as it feels to people. Um, our district is going to be insulated by this 5% cap. Um, with, we're not going to be able to, um, you know, we're not going to have a, a level tax rate. Um, that would be... I did some back of the envelope stuff here <clears throat> at my desk and we would have to cut like a third of our budget to, to have a level tax rate from FY24 to next year. So that it's kind of like, you know, not, not feasible, um, frankly. So I'm not even sure that I would ask um, Christina and, and Libby to even work on it. Cause it would just, it would look so bizarre. Um, so the 5% cap was designed for districts like us. Um, and, and I think that we should um, leverage it, basically. Um, and then as far as like planning for five years, um, trying to manage the Vermont, Vermont's education fund or know what's going to happen for five years is impossible. Um, I've tried it in the context of, you know, some governor's proposals in the past, and it's like <laughs> not really not doable. Um, so I'm, I think that in the short term, we should leverage the 5% cap and we should kind of see what happens um, with the new people weights and, and also, you know, how districts react, react to them. Um, so I am not as worried as others in the room at all. Um, and, and I think also a proposal that, that came out at the beginning of the meeting to try to try to understand this, this stuff as well as we could before we started thinking of solutions or, or, budget ideas um, is, is a good way to go. Um, I think that um, getting a handle on the, on the numbers and just some basic education funding stuff is important for us before we talk about budgets. Um, um, that being said, um, you know, the 5% five, the 5 cap is going to, is going to be what, what, um, you know, we experience and, and yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. <clears throat> follow-up question to Jake. Jake, I appreciate the sentiment that you don't feel it's as dire and that you're not as worried as some people in the room. Um, that gives me some relief. I'm wondering, you're, when you say we are insulated by the 5% cut and that we should leverage that, cap. are you... Cat, sorry. Cap. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Cap. Um, are you saying that <clears throat> we should look at... at the um, one point two million dollar decrease, or eight hundred dollar, eight hundred thousand dollar increase, or that we should just move the budget forward, uh, you know, at a more reasonable place. Wh which option I'm are saying you saying is in favor? There's, there's no, there's no way to, to, to have 
like a, a normal year over year change in equalized tax rate of like 1% or 2%, you're never going to get there. You'd have to cut millions and millions of dollars. Right. Um, so what I'm recommending is to proceed as normal. Like if, if you ask Libby and Christina to prepare some budget where our equalized tax rate was the same right. next year, even though the yield is going down by a third, you would be so shocked to see it that it would, you know, it's, it's kind of nonsensical. So I, I, what I, what I think we should do is, is sort of carry on with, you know, providing the great services that we do um, into next year. And then is my understanding that we would put that budget forward to the voters. They wouldn't know what the secretary's decision would be on whether they were going to deem it excessive or not at the time that they vote for the budget. So we would just be sort of crossing our fingers and hoping that the secretary would deem it reasonable. Yeah, the 10% the thing that's that was mentioned earlier, um, um, I, you know, again, would offer to work um, with Christina and Libby um, on this a little bit. Um, I don't see how we're going to hit that. Um, I just sort of back of the envelope. I, I don't, I'm, I, I, I would need to see the numbers, but I don't see how we could, how we could be going 10% year over year. Um, and that being said, like um, after Act 46, they put in a, a, a very similar um, provision on rate review and no, no districts were subject to this rate review. Um, so that, that happened in eight years ago in Act 46. Um, and, and I just don't see how this group is going to convenient convene and review districts budgets between when the yield bill is passed in late May and when the tax department has to give town tax rates for their bills on July 1st. Like, it doesn't seem that like that's even going to happen. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not proposing anything crazy that even would, as far as I know, that would trigger, you know, somebody's scrutiny. Like, you know, from what I've heard so far, it's like regular, you know, run of the mill salaries and benefits are mostly the, the cost driver. So um, I'm not concerned about the 10%. And I, I do want to reiterate my offer to work on the math um, with Christina and Libby on that. Because remember, when they compare the 10% change, you can't, it has to be apples to apples. So for FY24, you can't use equal pupils in FY24 and long-term weighted ADM for FY25 as a denominator, because those are different things. So what it says in the bill is when we look at your spending per pupil in FY24, we're going to use long-term weighted ADM for that too. And that makes it apples to apples. And that's why I don't see us going up by 10%. Are, we, are you suggesting that the numbers we have are wrong? Jim, I couldn't hear you so well. I said, are you suggesting the numbers that we were presented are, are inaccurate? Um, I have to take another look at it. I didn't see this document post. It, 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 um, and I'm also so kind just, of sick, so I, whatever just, I am saying could be off. But yeah. what, right. Just what Jake is saying is what Christina and I dug into today and asked Brad James specifically okay. which number to use. And he pointed to the number that we're using. Yeah, so I would say send me the numbers. Um, I want to I want to see what long term weighted ADM for FY24 is and for FY25 is because um, I haven't gotten that from Brad James. But um, you know, I, I I would like to to check it. And I don't what did, what what factor were you calculating for our year over year increase? What do you mean? Which factor, Jake? <clears throat> You you calculated some year over year increase in per pupil spending. I think that that's based on the raises that were just negotiated. I think there's an eighteen percent increase in health insurance costs that is also part of it, and that's basically all of the additions that Christina and Libby added to the budget. It's just we gave raises and teachers. I love you. You deserve them. <laughs> 
Um, and you know, we gave raises to Libby the year before, and I'm so grateful for what Libby's doing with the with the district as well. There's an 18 percent health insurance rate increase. 16. So 16, still still pretty massive. I think that those are the only increases. It's not like we're adding any positions, doing any dramatic anything. Um, there's no way I think that we could possibly be considered excessive. Yeah. And I don't trust, I don't know that these, everything's changing so fast. I think, I think we, 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 we we're in a tizzy and we need to take a breath. Uh, we definitely need to figure out and make sure, yeah, if, if you're right, Jake, that there's something in the calculus there you know, that, that we can just do the two million without hitting 10 percent. I think we have this year's answer. Um, but I think I think we have to be damn sure of that if if we're gonna. I mean, I do not want to. There, there's huge consequences of uh, hoping this committee doesn't come together and doesn't find that more than 10 percent is excessive without knowing that for sure. Well, we have we have a good chunk of time. Um, we do. Well, we have a, a, a chunk of time. I don't know if it's a chunk, chunk of time, chunk of time, time we want. This, this particular <laughs> math problem, you know, you know um, shouldn't be shouldn't too bad, be bad at, all. at all. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah so yeah, I'm happy so to take another, another look at it. And, and, and help us. Excellent. Um, students. students. I feel like I understand any of this well enough yet to talk about like the technical stuff. Um, I am also trying to stay calm and mostly like very overwhelmed by all of this, but I do want to say our role here is to try and represent somehow all the students in the district. I don't really know how to do that, but even just with the students at Montpelier High School, I have to say, um, this makes me really worried, obviously for all the reasons that everyone's worried, but also because my like group of students has been through a lot in the time that we've been in this district. I don't think I need to list everything out. I think people know what I mean. <laughs> it's been an interesting time. Um, and so for that reason, I'm not excited. Um, Also, um, along the, those lines, I totally understand the practicality of using the track money to help with this. That seems totally practical. It's also really disappointing. I know that's something that, it's a project that would have a massive benefit to the students in this community and the whole community. So I wanna make sure that, I don't know, we at least don't move ahead with that decision too fast. Yeah, I just want to make sure that, I don't know, just to state the obvious, any decision we make is going to have a massive impact on all the students in this district. And yeah, I don't think it's a prospect any of us are too excited about, and I certainly am not. Yeah, um, I agree with everything Miriam said. I think when Kristen was talking about like community and belonging, I think that for me that is my teachers are a part of that. Um, they've helped me through a lot, personal, academic. I think if my teachers aren't at their happiest, I don't know if I would be because the classroom really does reflect on the students. And um, I was just wondering, was there any discussion on how this decrease would impact students or like the classroom? And if there was, like, what did that look like? So to be clear, there isn't a decrease. Okay. We haven't made a budget yet. Yeah. So all we're talking about is the pressures on the budget. Yeah. Um, and potential scenarios that could potentially happen. Um, so there hasn't been those discussions because we haven't made any decisions okay. at all. We're, we're, need, we're gonna need direction from the board. Yeah on that so we those conversations haven't started to happen because we haven't made any decisions okay but they will happen yeah okay. 
So I know we've, we've done a lot tonight, and it's quarter to nine. Um, I think we've got most of what we need out there. Uh, I think one thing we should talk about, and I think it'll be a quick discussion, um, our next scheduled board meeting is the 15th, uh, then the 6th and the 20th, if I'm correct. Um, I think we need at least an extra board meeting, if not two, and the, the 29th and the 13th seem like obvious dates to prep, put something on a calendar. Um, what do folks think about that? Do we do want to schedule two? November 29th, um, which is not Thanksgiving week, it's the week after. Uh, and in terms of, do we want two, do we want one, do we want put two, see if we need it? Um, I think two? scheduling two, and then we can determine, you know, moving forward okay. if, we, if we need it. You know, I also think about this board that works incredibly diligently on the committee level. And with all of this going on, I just think that we also really need to give primary focus to the budget right now. Um, I mean, there are weeks that I spend hours on committee work, and it just feels like we need to relax that right now while we give this the focus it needs. Yeah, I, I, I think this is our primary focus for the next few. I mean, as, as we've seen tonight, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot to get our head around. Um, Scott? Um, I think I saw in one of the principal updates, um, meetings have already been scheduled with Truex Collins, is that correct, for the community visioning? Yeah. Um, and so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how much of this conversation will inevitably filter into those conversations, and if there's a benefit to holding off on that process do they does Trex need to have those meetings like next week and the and the couple weeks after um we have to change our agreement with them which i don't think they'd be opposed to i'm <laughs> curious why we would i, I i'm just wondering about the, the two timelines overlapping and potentially, like, they're very different conversations. In some ways, yes. In other ways, I think they're very connected. Yeah, so I think understanding if we want them to be connected or not, and if we don't want them to be connected, to, to separate them in time, if we do want them to be connected, then, then yeah, then I think that's, that's different. But understanding the impact of one process on the other, I guess, is it just I'm just trying to acknowledge that. I mean, I'd love to hear his other thoughts. I mean, one thing I think, you know, one thing that's really resonated with me is, if, you know, I think it would be ideal if we have to make big decisions about a building like Roxbury that we have time to do that. And I think the Truex Collins thing will, I mean, they'll buy ourselves another year on that. That could be great. Uh, and the Truex Cal Collins thing, I think, will help us with that. And I think if that gets off more slowly, that might give us less information, you know, if, if we are bought an extra year to think about that, to, you know, we, I would like to see the, the process move. We also have to, you know, figure out, uh, do we have expenses around this school that we have to, to budget in because of, of flood risk? So. Um, I mean, yeah, I think we could probably weave in some things from this budget conversation as the Truex Collins things go, but my, my preference would be to, to keep that going. I don't know if others feel different. Yeah, I, I was saying, saying it's, you know, it's all happening at once, but I think whatever comes out of the conversations about facility and flooding and long-term planning will absolutely impact how I'm looking at the five-year, 10-year yeah. budget. So I, I want that to happen. I don't think we'll have that information by January. No, we but won't. We'll, we'll have, have it, it for in next, March. Yeah. Right. And so, um, if, yeah. I'm sorry, I totally cut it off. No, that's okay. So I think the sooner we can see that, the better. The more time we'll have to use that information. But yeah, cause, cause I, I hear what you're saying. We don't want that to get side railed by 
the immediate budget conversation either or overwhelmed by that or yeah and I, from my perspective that process that facilities process is is part of what I I believe that all everyone needs to have an opportunity to engage in so that there's openness and, and transparency and and a dialogue with the community and the prospect of closing RBS as a as as a as a as a budget decision completely like gets destroyed. There's no there's none of that. And so I really hope that the Truex facilities thing can be really successful. And I'm not saying that you know hard decisions don't have to be made and they're gonna have to be made now and next year and the following year. I just really want those hard decisions to have as many voices involved as they can. And, um. To that end, I would also, I think we have two community engagement sessions planned with Truex, and I think both of them are going to happen at Montpelier High School. Um, and could we also plan for one to be held at Roxbury Village School? I think I, I can ask them. They're all virtual as well. But. I just think with the nature of the conversation here, it would be ideal if we could create some direct engagement opportunity in, in Roxbury. Okay. And, and we could we could structure something else to do that too if Travis Collins can't can't do it. Or maybe bring them into that. Maybe do bring them in virtually and do something with the school. So Jim, you were suggesting two more board meetings? Putting them yeah. on the calendar. Put it on the calendar. If we mm -hmm. don't need them, we don't use them. But um, you know, sticking with Wednesday, I, I, the 29th and 13th. Sure. Are, are there any objections to that? And also, I mean, you know, if one or two of us can't make it, right. uh, one or two of us can't make it. Uh, so, so let's, let's I'm, do that. Right. I'm sort of hoping that um, we can, that somehow there can be some sort of avenues forward like a variety of avenues forward that the board can look at like what does it look at if we spend yep. if we don't change anything what does it look like if we if rvs students are at ues what does it look like if we find a way yeah. to use the, the the fund balance you know in year one or in year two and the other the other factor though is how do what do each of those pathways look like in year two and year three even though it's impossible to predict that um, but it feels like having some things to really look at with as the best numbers that can possibly be brought together would help us sort of put these decisions in context. Yeah. Jake, did you that's want not, to? That's not Jake. Huh? Do you want to open up? We have a hand. Do you want to open up public comment back up? I don't think so. I think we I, we've okay. got plenty of time. We have plenty of meetings. So you can you can email us a, a question or um, yeah, we, we have two sessions. Is it Shannon Miller? Is the yeah, it's, 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 it's Jane Pinkus. She's I'm a, sure. I can reach out to her. She's a Roxbury resident too. Okay. There's someone in It's not. It's not Jane. Um, I just can I just I just had a real quick yeah. comment. Um, you know, it's I've been on the board since March 2020 which is a really funny time to start serving on a board. Um, certain things become a lightning rod. Like I, I hear the emotion and like response and I'm, I'm heartbroken to hear that people have been so upset because I feel like this is like step one. So, but I, I totally get it the same way that like the track, like it becomes like a one word, everyone, it becomes like a lightning rod, but the actual solution and where some of us are at is much more nuanced than that. I really want to hear selfishly what Truex Collins has to say about the middle school, because I feel like our teachers don't have what they need at the middle school. So like, I, w I don't want there to be an assumption by anyone that we're all here like, oh, this is going to be an easy, we're just going to make a swift decision. I think there's a lot more, I just want to be clear that we're, I don't think we're all universally focused on those two lightning rod items and then that's it like I just want to be really clear about that that there might be a lot more going on <laughs> yeah no, and, and I also I mean we want to be as deliberative as we can I don't think anyone on this board wants to make any quick decision um, on anything uh, right. RVS included in particular and again I want to stress I mean I was part of the RVS committee I was very supportive I, I'm very supportive of that school uh, 
as a school, I have I have no desire to close it and close it quickly, and the you know, and I want time for that discussion. Uh, but I think we have to get a very clear sense of what our situation is, what our options are, um, and and I'm going to be honest, that's one of the things we're going to have to talk about. Uh, and you know, like to be quite honest, this this board has has brought that up, but you know taking on the discussion of making sure RVS is in a viable position so we didn't have to make a RAS decision on the budget. And I think it's partially on this board to say we've we've kicked that conversation down the road and we're now at a point where we might have to have it more quickly than we want to, uh, which I think is unfortunate. But um, no one wants no one wants to do that. Um, I think myself at, at the head of that and, and clearly, you know, I know I know what it means to that community. I know what small schools Schools bring people together. Uh, it's you know they bring people together in Roxbury. Uh, they bring people together in Montpelier. Um, they are staples of communities, and um, no one is going to make a rash decision about a centerpiece of a community any more quickly than we have to. Um, Hello, could I'd like to say something? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah. Okay, my name is yeah. I'm Jane Pickus, and I just wanted to say thank you all for your consideration. Um, I've lived in Roxbury for over 50 years now, and I've seen how the school has has developed and grown over these 50 years. My children went there years ago. I I just want to thank you for your for the work that. Rhett and Kristen are doing for the school and for their passion. And I feel kind of, I want everything to work out. I'm not good at learning about tax information, but I've been really, I've learned a lot from your discussion tonight. So I just wanted to thank you. And I think it would be wonderful to have a discussion here in Roxbury um, in these next few months, if you've got the time and inclination. So once again, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. And, and since the, the the floor opened, I'm, I'm to be fair, someone else wanted to get a word in as well. Please, please give it to you know under a minute if you if you can. I was just gonna say, I, I sent an email as well. I I think it's my fault. I haven't attended before in a budget meeting, and so wrapping my head around what the budget process used like was before the changes and absorbing all of the information that's happening now. If there's like a budget 101 meeting where there could be some like more information to give time to digest what that was before and all of the acronyms as they threw through the slides to understand that a little bit better, that would be helpful. Yeah, I do want to say the the agency of education or is it VSBA has like kind of a VSBA. VSBA has like a schoolhouse rock video type thing of the budget. I'm also gonna say I've been on this board. I've been on this board since 2016. I cannot tell you that I fully wrapped my head around what the budget process means. It's it's very Byzantine. Um, so we, we will try to make it as simple as possible, but it's it's not it's it's not a simple formula. Um, let's let's do the policy monitoring uh, and then adjourn. We obviously have a lot to talk about over the next few months. Uh, any final comments on? I just, I just hope everyone has a good night's sleep tonight, and especially the Roxbury community members. Um, you know, the the meeting. To, I was hoping that the meeting tonight would give me a lot of clarity, and it has in some ways, and it hasn't in other ways. But as an individual board member, I can only speak for myself. But I would not be interested in supporting a budget that would close a school, you know, this quickly. So I, you know, I want to explore the other options, and am most interested in Jake's perspective of pushing a budget forward that's more reasonable and expecting that that will be deemed reasonable by the secretary. And I know that that's you know, going to require a lot of education. So I'm, I'm looking to the community that's in the room to support us in educating other people so that the budget is not voted down if we do go that route. Tylenol PM, sold at CVS. <laughs> Ran out last night. <laughs> I, um, I just before we move on to the um, 
budget monitoring to say, I think where we've landed is we've heard initial thoughts from board members. We've answered some questions. And um, Rhett's request, I was going to also kind of re re kind of recap it in the same way Rhett did, which is like, let's see a few general scenarios the next time we come back to the budget. Yeah. One that is the like, we do nothing. One that is the, um, you know, what are the all the cuts we could make um, that feel reasonable? What is the really like, re like really hard one? You know, like let's let's see a few paths, yeah. not with any specific details, but what do the number? How do the numbers play out? I think that's what you were saying, Rhett, and I yeah. think that is the a logical next step after today. Yep. Yeah. No, I asked. I asked for that as well. Um, and I think another thing too, um, Tom, I'm, you've spoken twice, plenty of meetings ahead. I appreciate it, but please, I think an email. Um, uh, and then also getting together with Jake and um, and uh, do some do some math and, and doing some math. Yeah, Tom, didn't mean to cut you off. I, I appreciate all you've brought to the board tonight, but. Um, I think we do need to, to limit comment, and, and you have spoken, and, and the other people had, had not had a chance to speak, which is why, why I opened it up. But you can send us an email, out and um, I certainly hope that you and everyone else, you know, follow. A lot of us will be lingering meetings. around after the meeting yeah, too, for, if you for want questions. to bend our ear for a minute. Um, and again, like remember, we, we have not made we have not made any decisions, and just and also. Just make it clear, just because we look at something doesn't mean we're going to do it. I mean, we need to look at a lot of things. And most of the things we look at, we are not going to do. Um, uh, the policy monitoring report. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. A second? Let's just, for the record, say, are you doing all three at once, Emma? Oh, yes, policy monitoring D4. If somebody else has the agenda open, I guess they CM should. CM and F20. There you go, Emma. Yeah. So moved. Second. Right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. <laughs>